first of all, I would like to express the deep satisfaction of the Ramon Arises Foundation to have once more, one year more, this joint venture with Springer Nature. And uh, in this occasion, we are going to utilize the telematic system. But next year, I am sure that we will be again utilizing the presential way and that we would be able to once more celebrate this encounter with so distinguished uh, scientists and uh, persons that are devoted to study the issues that are in the frontier of knowledge, as is the case of uh, this uh, pandemic that now we are trying to face. Tengo que decirles que es muy importante que se hable de lecciones de la COVID-19 para prevenir futuras pandemias. Fíjense, la palabra prevención es una palabra que desde el año 75 ya cobró en la Fundación Ramón Areces un gran peso. Todo el mundo decía que lo que tenemos que hacer efectivamente es promover la investigación científica, es promover los sistemas de cuidados en sanidad que puedan favorecer y a continuación decíamos la prevención. Y la prueba es que empezamos trabajando con la bioquímica perinatal para la prevención mediante el diagnóstico adecuado y el tratamiento oportuno de una serie de metabolopatías que si no se podían abordar en el momento del nacimiento, después ya era demasiado tarde. Ya eran fenómenos irreversibles. Ahora, ahora es muy importante que volvamos a pensar en los fenómenos irreversibles, que volvamos a pensar en que ecológicamente, ecológicamente el mundo está yendo hacia realmente el desastre si ahora ya con Biden en los Estados Unidos no somos capaces de retomar la Agenda 2030 para el cambio medioambiental y para transformar el mundo, como dice tan bellamente la resolución de las Naciones Unidas del mes de noviembre de 2015. Dice, esta Agenda 2030, estos objetivos de desarrollo sostenible son para transformar el mundo. Bueno, pues yo lo que les quería decir es eso, es que yo recuerdo que don Ramón Areces, el fundador, ya decía, lo que tenemos que hacer es procurar, fíjense que es muy interesante como lo decía, decía, prevenir o paliar el sufrimiento humano. Y para eso es para lo que realmente la Fundación Ramón Areces dio y desde aquel momento ha sido incesante, sobre todo para las enfermedades infrecuentes, dio cantidades muy importantes para fomentar la investigación de tal manera que pudiéramos, vuelvo a repetir, prevenir o paliar o mitigar el sufrimiento humano. El mismo sentimiento exactamente tuvo el sucesor de don Ramón Areces, Don Isidoro Álvarez estaba realmente siempre hablando de lo que era importante, de que era importante las lecciones para prevenir que supiéramos tener este deber de memoria y aprender las lecciones de cada uno de estos fenómenos para poder en el futuro prevenir, evitar el que estas enfermedades tuvieran realmente un efecto pandémico y muy fuerte como están teniendo en estos momentos. Y lo mismo les podría decir del actual presidente de la Fundación Ramón Areces. Don Florencio Lasaga siempre ha sido un defensor de todo aquello que puede llevar al conocimiento, a la prevención, a las técnicas para el diagnóstico oportuno y sobre todo para el tratamiento oportuno. Todo eso lo he dicho para que vean ustedes hasta qué punto nos interesa dentro de esta memoria que ahora ya podemos tener, por, uh, que han pasado ya muchos meses de que en Wuhan, en, la India, en China, 
empezaran los primeros casos de este nuevo virus y nos hemos dado cuenta de que hay algo que antes no existía. Cuando yo era joven había pandemias, epidemias, perdón, muy, mucho más uh, uh, agresivas que el virus COVID-19. Y sin embargo, pues uh, estábamos todos esperando a que pasara aquello para que eran siempre en determinadas áreas, pero no hay que olvidar que teníamos que hacer frente a la viruela, a la varicela, al sarampión, a la tuberculosis, a la rubeola, etcétera, etcétera, etcétera. Bien, todo eso se ha ido gracias a los sistemas de vacunación y de tratamiento oportuno, se ha ido limitando. Pero ahora ya lo que nos tenemos que dar cuenta es un deber de memoria, es de que ahora las epidemias se transformarán muy rápidamente en pandemias. ¿Por qué? Pues por el inmenso tráfico humano. Ustedes calculen el tráfico humano que había en los años que les estoy contando, en los años 45 a 50 en España, y se pueden imaginar ahora con el turismo y con todos los desplazamientos, el tráfico humano se ha incrementado de tal manera que cualquier brote epidémico se transformará rápidamente en un brote pandémico. Yo por este motivo quiero expresar a Springer Nature la satisfacción de poder colaborar un año más, decirles que esperamos seguir colaborando con esta institución porque es una institución de gran prestigio y que siempre sirve precisamente para eso, para fijar pautas de prevención, pautas de saber y de sabiduría para que podamos ir haciendo frente progresivamente y con éxito a estas pandemias, que ahora en lo sucesivo serán más frecuentes, por eso que les digo, porque piensen ustedes lo que significan los vuelos diarios que hay desde Europa hacia cualquier parte del mundo. Y pongan ustedes de, mirando desde China o mirando desde Norteamérica o mirando desde América y se dan ustedes cuenta de que realmente ahora vale la pena y hacerlo con Springer Nature, vale la pena sentarse y decir, bueno, vamos a estudiar cuáles son los grandes obstáculos que hoy se presentan para poder actuar debidamente, para poder actuar a tiempo en el diagnóstico y en la acción preventiva. Y por tanto, yo quiero decirle a Soledad Santos Suárez, directora de la editorial España y Portugal de Springer Healthcare, en Springer Nature, decirle que me complace mucho cederle ahora la palabra para que ha de paso a Erika Pastrana, la editora ejecutiva de Nature Research en Nueva York, ya para que se desarrollen debidamente las ponencias. Vuelvo a repetir lo que antes les decía, que es muy importante. Prevención o ver cómo podemos mitigar los efectos de estas enfermedades. Y a partir de ahora no cabe duda de que tendrá que haber una acción social, una acción de los ciudadanos, que ahora ya pueden participar. Hace unos años, cuando yo les estoy contando todo eso de la rubeola y de la tuberculosis, etc., los ciudadanos no existían en realidad. Había un poder absoluto que era el que mandaba y se acabó. Ahora no. Ahora progresivamente los ciudadanos ya pueden expresarse. Ahora progresivamente los ciudadanos ya pueden seguir pautas que sean razonables. Ahora también progresivamente las autoridades científicas deben a los irresponsables, a aquellos que con sus actividades están haciendo a veces muy difícil que puedan tomarse estas medidas preventivas a tiempo y de una manera oportuna para que el delito contra la salud sea considerado eso, sea considerado un delito y que no haya todas estas desviaciones de las pautas tan sabias que normalmente nos dan las autoridades sanitarias para poder evitar, para poder mitigar el sufrimiento humano que produce la COVID-19. Muchas gracias. 
Muchas gracias por asistir hoy a la decimotercera conferencia de debate en colaboración de la Fundación Ramón Areces y el Grupo Springer Nature, que este año dedicamos a las enfermedades infecciosas emergentes, queriendo aprender lecciones de la COVID-19 para aprender futuras pandemias. Tras este año complejo en el que hemos aprendido a convivir con una pandemia provocada por el virus SARS-CoV-2, queremos reflexionar sobre aquellos aspectos de la situación actual que nos pueden ayudar a afrontar nuevas. Nos gustaría pensar que esta es una situación aislada, pero sabemos que la prevalencia de las infecciones eleva el riesgo de que volvamos a enfrentarnos a otra pandemia. El Centro de Control de Enfermedades estadounidense nos dice que el 75% de las infecciones emergentes están provocados por virus que residen en los animales y saltan a la especie humana. Y así lo hemos visto en las últimas décadas con el virus del SIDA, el del ébola y hoy y ahora el del SARS-CoV-2. Este año es la primera vez en nuestros 13 años de andadura en los que repetimos temática. Hace 8, en el 2013, escuchamos al profesor Albert House acercar, eh, contarnos acerca de posibles virus emergentes y de estrategias que podrían prevenir su, su difusión. Hoy vamos a escuchar cómo el SARS-CoV-2 se, se ha distribuido a nivel mundial, cómo es la enfermedad que provoca y cómo podemos estudiar su propagación con modelos matemáticos. Para todo el equipo de Springer Nature es una satisfacción poder continuar con nuestra colaboración con la Fundación Ramón Areces. Desde Springer Nature tenemos el compromiso de contribuir en la medida de, de nuestras posibilidades a la difusión de los últimos avances científicos y durante este año hemos proporcionado acceso a, gratuito a 70.000 artículos y capítulos de libros y además hemos publicado 14.000 artículos relacionados con el COVID-19. Desde Springer 19 queremos agradecer la valentía del Comité Científico de la Fundación Ramón Areces, representado por el profesor Federico Mayor Zaragoza, por atreverse a repetir temática y por haber entendido la necesidad de difundir los últimos avances de esta pandemia de la mano de tres ponentes de prestigio mundial. Agradecemos también el compromiso a la Fundación por transmitir la mejor ciencia y el conocimiento a la, a la sociedad en general, las conversaciones online desde la Fundación han abordado temas fundamentales en este año, tanto los específicos de la COVID-19 como cómo esta pandemia está afectando a nivel económico y educacional a nuestro país. Una vez más, queremos agradecer al director general de la Fundación, el señor Raimundo Pérez Hernández y Torra, y al señor Manuel Azcona, director de comunicación, su confianza en nosotros por organizar estas jornadas. Quisiera agradecer a los ponentes Bart Hammans, Cristina Calvo y Rosalind Ego su disponibilidad para participar. Esperamos que disfrutéis tanto como nosotros. Y por último, muchas gracias a Erika Pastrana, nuestra directora editorial de Nature Research. Muchas gracias por cada año moderar este evento. Sin más, espero que disfruten de las jornadas. Muchas gracias, Soledad. Um, buenas tardes a todos. Quisiera agradecer un año más a la Fundación Ramón Areces su dedicación y compromiso con el avance científico y la divulgación de la ciencia. Es probable que la importancia de la ciencia y la investigación no haya sido tan real y tangible nunca como este año que hemos vivido, intentando ganan, ganarle terreno a este virus que todos ya conocemos muy bien. Eh, esta in introducción va a ser muy breve porque no hace falta que introduzca el tema que nos ocupa hoy, el coronavirus SARS-CoV-2, muy desgraciadamente ha infectado ya a, 11, a 100 millones de personas, no, más de 2 millones en España y ha causado la muerte de más de 50.000 personas en nuestro país. A pesar de que antes de esta pandemia, como dijo el señor Federico, eh, tuvimos otras epidemias de gran gravedad como el SIDA, el SARS, el COV, eh, el, el MERS, el ébola, Nuestras sociedades no estaban preparadas para combatir un enemigo que se transmite tan eficientemente como el SARS-CoV-2. Sin embargo, la investigación científica y médica se ha volcado intensamente este año y ha unido fuerzas internacionales para, en un tiempo completamente inconcebible antes, desarrollar tratamientos y vacunas en contra de una enfermedad y un patógeno que apenas conocíamos hace año y medio. Para discutir y presentar estos avances tenemos a tres expertos de renombre internacional y es un placer para mí presentarles el, el simposio que hoy nos ocupará en el que vamos a cubrir tanto características del virus y de su patogenia 
de su epidemiología, su difusión en el mundo y cómo eh, planear el desarrollo de, de vacunaciones mundiales, tanto como los detalles clínicos eh, que cuadra precisamente contra un sector muy importante de la, de la población como los niños. Si después de estas tres interesantes charlas tendremos unos minutos para un debate en el que nos centraremos sobre todo en lo que de nuevo el doctor Federico Mayor eh, nos decía, vamos a hablar sobre la prevención y qué lecciones hemos aprendido durante este año para ayudarnos a combatir eh, esta pandemia y posiblemente futuras. Sin más dilación, quisiera introducir al primero de nuestros ponentes, el doctor Park Hagmans, que es jefe de grupo de investigación del Departamento de Virología del Centro Médico Erasmus de Rotterdam, en Holanda. La investigación de su grupo se centra en la patogénesis de las infecciones virales y especialmente en los virus que, se, que surgen por transmisión zoonótica, incluido el SARS-CoV-2. Anteriormente, el doctor Hagmans eh, jugó un papel importantísimo en el, en el estudio del virus del MERS y hoy nos contará cómo esas investigaciones fueron clave para que su grupo colaborase con otros grupos de investigación en el desarrollo de nuevos tratamientos y vacunas contra el SARS-CoV-2. Sin más dilación, quisiera entonces dar la palabra al Dr. Bart Hagmans. So thank you so much, Erica, for the nice introduction and the invitation. So we focus uh, most on the pathogenesis of coronaviruses, and that's what I'm going to discuss today, and also focusing on uh, transmission. So coronaviruses actually are found both in humans and in animals. And in humans, we know four coronaviruses that circulate all over the world. So these actually already caused the pandemic a uh, long time ago. And more recently, three zoonotic coronavirus appeared on the on the ski on the, on the, in, in, in the world that <clears throat> uh, made the transition from animals to humans. And that's in SARS-CoV in 2003, MERS-CoV in 2012, and as you all know, last year in 2019, late 2019, the SARS-CoV virus 2. So one of the main questions, of course, is if you compare all these different coronaviruses, why SARS-CoV-2 is so successful and differs from other zoonotic transmissions uh, that happened by SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV. And a more <clears throat> urgent question at the moment is, is, is the virus SARS-CoV-2 changing and are these uh, variants that appear now, are they more transmissible? So I will focus on both aspects. First focus a little bit on MERS coronavirus, a few slides. And uh, MERS coronavirus actually uh, is a typical coronavirus in that on the outside of the virion, there are the uh, coronavirus proteins that form the corona, and these are the spike proteins. And these are important in the interaction with the receptor. And uh, that is shown here, so that one domain particular, the domain B, the receptor binding domain in this case, interacts with the receptor the dipeptidyl peptidase 4. There are also other interactors located in the S1 region, and that's the domain A, which interacts with sialic acids. But <clears throat> the presence of the virus in dromedary camels and the similarity of this receptor in dromedary camels and humans causes the spillover of this virus, especially in the Middle East. And in humans, this virus causes a lower respiratory tract infection. So that's indicated here, a lower respiratory tract infection in humans, whereas in dromedaries, it's mainly an upper respiratory tract infection. And I think the, the interesting point here is, is that if you look at this, the localization of this DPP4, the receptor, you'll find that it is expressed in the dromedary camel nose, so in the upper respiratory tract, but not in the upper respiratory tract of humans. It's mainly in the lower respiratory tract. So this differential expression of this receptor for this coronavirus is actually very important so that in humans, it's limited in spread because there is no upper respiratory tract expression of this uh, receptor. And this is also then evident from the epidemic curve of the human MERS cases in time, from 2012 till now, we have seen multiple outbreaks, which are spillovers from dromedary camels to humans. And this is 
totally different what we have seen for, for SARS-CoV-2, one big outbreak. And that is related in this case to the presence of the, the receptor mainly as a primary determinant. So the fact that the dromedaries are actually the zoonotic uh, reservoir also uh, gives the opportunity of an intervention at the level of the dromedaries. So making a vaccine for dromedaries would uh, uh, potentially block spillover to humans. So as said for MERS, the interaction DPP4 is an important issue. And if we look at the receptor for SARS coronaviruses, that's the angiotensin converting enzyme 2, this is expressed in the upper respiratory tract. So different from MERS, now SARS-like viruses actually can target the upper respiratory tract. And this causes all the problems what we see with the SARS-CoV-2 outbreak. So this is the paper from the Wuhan Institute describing the <clears throat> genetic characterization of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, a typical coronaviruses, a virus with a <clears throat> uh, 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 gene, the OF1, which codes for uh, uh, non-structural genes, uh, proteins, and then the spike protein uh, and other uh, uh, structural uh, genes that code for the nucleocapsid and the E gene. So if you look at the phylogenetic <clears throat> analysis of the SARS coronavirus, you see that the SARS-CoV-2 viruses cluster here, and they are not that far away from other bat-related viruses that circulated in, uh, uh, in China, and that are also possibly the, 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 the uh, origin of the SARS-CoV virus that was uh, spilled over in 2002-2003. So these are quite closely related. So what we did in the early uh, outbreak in February is to first test the pathogenicity and the tropism of this virus in an uh, animal model. And that is in this case, non-human primates. So if you inoculate non-human primates, actually you'll find excretion of virus uh, from the nose over long periods, especially in aged animals. So there's extended excretion in the aged animals. And the virus can be detected, especially in the respiratory tract, but also in the uh, enteric tract, and that's shown here, um, and consistent also with replication in enterocytes. So uh, it has been shown that uh, this could be uh, excretion of virus, but that the transmission through this route is probably quite limited, so that the main transmission is to the upper respiratory tract. And that's also evident in these non human primates in that in the nose, ciliated epithelial cells actually express SARS-CoV-2 upon infection, showing that in different from MERS-CoV, now the virus can target uh, cells in the nose, um, uh, facilitating easy transmission from, uh, in this case, from, from, from potentially from uh, non-human primate to non-human primate, especially from human to human, of course. And then there is, of course, replication in the lower respiratory tract in the alveoli causing also inflammation. And that can be seen also in this picture so that gross patholo pathological lesions are seen in some animals, not so many. In our experiment, only two animals showed these gross path uh, lesions. And if you look more closely <coughs> by uh, microscopy, you'll find that the alveoli actually are filled with edema. There's influx of, uh, of neutrophils and macrophages and also syncytia cells are seen, although they do not express antigen, but they are positive for an epithelial marker. And these lesions are quite the same as what you see for SARS, but also for MERS-CoV. So this is quite, uh, is not very typical for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, in this case, we didn't find so much difference with in, in age in the lower respiratory tract, but we know from experiments with SARS-CoV, so the virus from 2003, that if you compare young adult and aged macaques, you'll find that gross lesions are mostly seen in the aged animals. And that can be seen here. So on scoring, there's an increased uh, uh, occurrence of uh, pathological changes in the aged animals, although their, the viral replication is, is quite the same. And that's quite interesting. So how do these uh, viruses then cause this more pronounced disease in the aged animals. 
So then if you do a comparative analysis of host genes uh, and you compare young and adult uh, macaques, you find that uh, some genes are differentially expressed and these genes especially are uh, genes that are activated by the nf kappa b complex and include uh, genes like R1, R6, and R8. And that is quite reminiscent of, of ARDS, Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome, which is a general phenomena in the uh, uh, injury of the alveolus, which is characterized by the influx of uh, neutrophils, macrophages, destruction of the alveolar wall, and then either proliferation of, of cells, the type two cells, restoring the alveolus or fibrosis. And especially in aged individuals, this uh, induction of, of these cytokines, which are involved in this uh, pathological phenomena in the lungs is increased. And we know that we named it that, and that is known as inflammaging. And if you look at the pathogenesis of SARS-CoV-2 in humans, <clears throat> you'll find, so as said, that the virus first attaches to uh, the upper respiratory tract, ciliated cells that express ACE2. Then the virus replicates in the lower respiratory tract, inducing influ uh, influx of uh, macrophages and neutrophils that cause the pathogenic release of cytokines. Um, one thing I think that is different from what we have seen or what was observed in SARS-CoV-1 is that apart from this ARDS, uh, there's a clear indication that also there's a problem with uh, uh, in the uh, uh, blood clotting so that uh, not only the, 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 the vascular system, but also the, the alveoli are involved in the pathogenesis of the virus in humans. So that suppression of this inflammatory response has been uh, um, beneficial in treating patients. And I think it's the only uh, treatment that works so that all the others like antivirals and, and antibodies have to be given quite soon. And that only uh, in the later stages, you can work with dexamethasone or anticoagulants to suppress the inflammatory response. So what is interesting for SARS-CoV-2, and <clears throat> which was a bit surprising, is that before these uh, symptoms occur and the lower respiratory tract uh, uh, becomes infected, there's a, a huge peak of our excretion from the upper respiratory tract that causes the transmission. And that's really the problem, SARS-CoV-2. And that is quite different from SARS-CoV-1, let's call it the virus from 2003, in that in that case, the virus peaked after these uh, symptoms were seen and patients were taken to the hospital. So in that case, quarantine and isolation of patients was effective so that the outbreak could, could be contained. So I think this is in general seen as, as one of the main problems, which was in the early days uh, not really recognized. I mean, the Chinese said there was not really uh, efficient transmission. Um, and uh, we have seen that, that this is really the case. And the concern is that the virus will transmit even more efficient with uh, uh, different variants coming up. And especially one of the early variants, and that is a variant uh, called the G614 that replaced the D614, which was circulating in Wuhan actually conquered the whole world. So uh, most of the cases now are viruses that have this uh, mutation, G614. And the idea is that this virus spreads more efficiently uh, between humans and has uh, 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 competed with the earlier virus that was present in Wuhan. And different in vitro experiments, but especially also in vivo experiments in hamsters and ferrets have shown that if you do a competition between those two viruses, actually the virus that has the G at 614 wins. And this is the virus that transmits more efficiently. So this is one variant that really uh, uh, succeeded in a more efficient transmission. And more recently, and that's over the last uh, few weeks, we have heard of, of different other variants that popped up, and that is the 1117 in the UK, 
and then the one three five one that's in South Africa, and especially those two are of, of, of interest at the moment. And that the idea is that not only that will transmit more efficiently, and that's because there are multiple uh, now there are multiple mutations, not only in spike but also in other regions of the virus that could affect the transmission. But also the idea is that there is immune escape, so that both uh, individuals that already experienced an infection, as well as vaccinees, would uh, uh, have problems in clearing this uh, new uh, this new variant. And recent data, and I think this is data from yesterday, and I think interesting to share is that, for example, here in BioArchives is data on the Moderna vaccine-induced uh, immune response. That is, if you take serum from those that are vaccinated with the Moderna vaccine, actually they can neutralize uh, uh, the B117 a variant quite efficiently. So that is uh, similar to, to the wild type virus. In contrast, there is a significant reduction for, for the other variant that popped up. So that's the variant that was found originally in, in, uh, in, uh, in South Africa. Um, and so and there is clearly a reduction there in the capacity of the antibodies induced by the vaccine to neutralize the virus. But the idea is that for the Moderna vaccine, because there are high levels of antibodies induced, this still leaves enough antibodies to, um, to say that the, uh, the vaccine is still protective. So the question still is, does this hold also for the other vaccine candidates? And vaccines are needed. And it's not only the Moderna vaccine, but also, as you know, Pfizer and CureVac have uh, followed the, the same route in developing RNA vaccines that code for the spike protein uh, to induce both cellular as well as humoral immune responses. I think one other interesting other option is to use the adenovirus to code for this spike protein. And that is the vaccines by AstraZeneca and by uh, Janssen, uh, so Johnson & Johnson. So these will be on the market soon. And the question is how they will protect against also uh, the variants, if these variants are able to transmit efficiently. And of course, these <coughs> vaccines have uh, progressed quite a, a, a quick over the last year. And that's not only due to the fact that there is an overlap in the different phases of, of evaluation in the phase one to phase three and the <coughs> criteria and, and speed of uh, uh, facilitating the approval of these vaccines to be used uh, uh, for humans, but also the, the knowledge on, on, on MERS-CoV and SARS-CoV-1 was, of course, instrumental in designing the candidate uh, vaccines that were now uh, developed. Many other <coughs> candidates are still uh, in line, but I think uh, we have to look at the, at the ones that are now developed and are on the market. So looking forward and, and, and what is the lesson here and how do we see it for the future? I think as said in the beginning, and there are viruses that are quite successful and caused a pandemic earlier and spreading all over the world uh, every year. Um, and these human coronavirus probably will now also include the SARS-CoV-2. So that's one thing. We probably not get rid of this virus uh, now and in the future. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we may also see new novel uh, SARS-CoV variants that pop up and, and cross the species barrier. And uh, to close is, is that this week there was also a report from Hong Kong from the group of Kok Yen and uh, Patrick Wu showing that a virus in bats that's related to MERS coronavirus actually can infect uh, transgenic mice that use the human DP4, suggesting that the virus also as the potential to cross the species barrier. So uh, we may conquer this SARS-CoV-2, but I think there's still the threat of new viruses popping up. And with that, I close and give back to the chair. Thank you very much, Bart, for a very interesting talk. Um, appreciate also um, the, the timeliness um, of your data. So thank you so much. Uh, without further ado, 
Um, I'm going to introduce Cristina Calvo. Uh, de nuevo me paso al español, si me permiten. Cristina Calvo es eh, jefe de sección del Servicio de Pediatría de la, y de la Sección de Enfermedades Infecciosas y Tropicales en el Hospital Universitario de La Paz, en Madrid. La doctora Calvo compatiza su trabajo clínico con la investigación sobre las infecciones virales. En concreto, su grupo estudia las infecciones respiratorias agudas en las vías respiratorias inferiores. Eh, en particular en, en la población de los niños. Su grupo también estudia la respuesta inmunológica en los niños a las infecciones virales y eh, en los últimos años, eh, en concreto este último año, la doctora Calvo ha, ha trabajado estrechamente con el Centro Nacional de Virología para eh, contribuir eh, con resultados muy importantes para el eh, tratamiento y la contención de la pandemia en niños eh, en España. Eh, es un gran placer, Cristina, y te paso la palabra. Eh, muchas gracias. Voy a intentar compartir la pantalla. Buenas tardes y agradecer a la Fundación Ramón Areces, a Springer Nature y a Erika Pastrana por haberme invitado. Eh, para mí es un honor eh, representar a la pediatría en este, en este foro. Bueno, estos son los aspectos que voy a tratar en la charla. Voy a empezar eh, por la epidemiología. Y bueno, en la primera eh, onda de la pandemia eh, hemos diagnosticado eh, aproximadamente eh, entre 1 y 2% de los casos de coronavirus han sido pediátricos. Y digo hemos diagnosticado porque en aquel momento teníamos eh, muy escasez, eh, mucha escasez de técnicas diagnósticas y solamente diagnosticábamos aquellos niños que llegaban a los hospitales eh, verdaderamente eh, malos. ¿Y cómo han sido estas infecciones? Pues a pesar de todo han sido leves en azul, la serie china o la italiana, solo un 30% o menos han sido moderadas y pocos han sido graves, siendo los niños más graves o los menores de un año o los mayores de 10-11 años. Esto en España ha supuesto unos 1.400 niños en la primera ola, la mayoría fueron ambulantes, un 26% se hospitalizaron y pocos necesitaron eh, ingresos en cuidados intensivos. Esto supuso el 1% del total de casos en aquel momento. Esta imagen compara series de diferentes eh, regiones del mundo en el que vemos cómo en todos ellos en rojo hubo un porcentaje importante de niños hospitalizados dentro de los diagnosticados, porque como digo, solo se eh, diagnosticaban aquellos que llegaban a los hospitales. Todas las series coinciden en que los factores de riesgo, además de la edad que ya he mencionado y de tener un contacto conocido en niños que, que les ha obligado a hospitalizar, han sido las comorbilidades. Entre un cuarto y un 50% de los niños que se han hospitalizado tenían comorbilidades. En España, en la segunda ola y en todo el mundo, en el momento que hemos dispuesto de técnicas diagnósticas suficientes, Hemos visto cómo en pocos meses, en tres meses, se han diagnosticado en España más de 170.000 niños y eh, la inmensa mayoría de ellos han sido cuadros leves y menos de un 1% han necesitado hospitalización. En este momento ya suponía el 12% del total de casos diagnosticados en España. Esto ha sido igual en Estados Unidos. Esta es una gráfica de Pediatrics del mes de octubre en el que vemos cómo los niños ya suponen casi un 16% del total de casos, aunque la población pediátrica de Estados Unidos está cerca del 22%. ¿Y se infectan más o menos frecuentemente que los adultos? Bueno, hay muchos estudios que han tratado de aclarar esto. Este es un primer estudio de, eh, llevado a cabo en Ginebra, en los niños que llegaron al hospital y que se diagnosticaron, eh, estudiaron a todos sus contactos familiares y vieron cómo eh, en el 80% de los casos siempre había un adulto previamente infectado y solamente en el 8% de los casos los niños tuvieron síntomas antes, lo que hace claro pensar que los niños se infectan en el hogar. Si vemos este gráfico, arriba están los adultos y abajo los niños y en verde los que se infectaron antes, confirmamos cómo siempre o casi siempre son los adultos los que empiezan a tener la infección y solo eh, un pequeño porcentaje de niños se infectan antes. Este estudio es muy parecido, realizado en China, son 195 clústeres eh, con más de 1.900 contactos. Ellos observan cómo las transmisiones son casi siempre en el hogar y son menos frecuentes y de manera significativa en la población menor de 20 años. 
esos estudios estaban realizados con PCR, pero sin embargo, si hacemos o, o, o nos fijamos en este estudio realizado en Barcelona con 400 familias con una persona infectada, vemos cómo los porcentajes de seroconversión son muy parecidos en niños y en adultos. O sea que parece que los niños también se infectan, aunque sea de manera más leve. Y este estudio que hemos realizado nosotros en el Hospital La Paz, en 64 familias eh, de trabajadores sanitarios infectados, analizamos sus 113 niños y vemos cómo el 40% de ellos han tenido serología positiva y todos han sido cuadros leves o asintomáticos sin precisar eh, hospitalizaciones. O sea que los niños parece que sí se infectan, aunque tienen cuadros más leves. ¿Y por qué tienen cuadros más leves los niños? Bueno, hay una serie de factores que eh, hacen que tengan un riesgo incrementado los adultos y otros que parecen proteger a los niños. Dentro de los que incrementan el riesgo de los adultos, desde luego están las comorbilidades, que son frecuentes y múltiples en adultos y raras en niños. El déficit de vitamina D se ha asociado con el aumento del riesgo de infecciones respiratorias y en niños es infrecuente porque eh, no tienen deficiencia de vitamina D y muchas veces están eh, suplementados. El endotelio de los adultos, como veíamos en la charla que nos ha precedido, eh, es fundamental el endotelio y la función de la coagulación. El endotelio de los adultos está predañado, eh, con facilidad eh, da lugar a la producción de trombos y los adultos tienen eh, ese endotelio dañado mientras que los niños tienen un endotelio sano y su eh, eh, función de coagulación tiene menos eh, propensión a, a desarrollar eh, coágulos de forma natural. De hecho, en nuestra serie nacional solamente unos cuatro niños eh, han tenido fenómenos eh, trombóticos. La inmunosenescencia, que es el deterioro de la inmunidad eh, innata de los adultos, de la inmunidad adaptativa de los adultos, favorecido por las infecciones crónicas también, hace que respondan peor a las infecciones y que tengan células T con baja avidez eh, por la infección eh, por coronavirus. Eh, y por último, si eh, analizamos el receptor AC2, que, eh, del que se ha discutido muchísimo y hay teorías a favor y en contra, sabemos que los adultos tienen mayor número de receptores AC2, también un incremento de la proteína transmembrana con la edad y eso posiblemente facilita la entrada del virus, al igual que determinadas variantes de AC2 que se han eh, asociado con mayor severidad. En contra de esto tenemos también que la AC2 tiene una potencia antiinflamatoria y que puede proteger contra el síndrome del estrés respiratorio del adulto, por lo cual no está verdaderamente claro su papel. ¿Y qué factores van a proteger a los niños? Bueno, pues si empezamos por el hacedor, igual que AC2, igual que hemos terminado con los adultos, sabemos que los niños tienen menos receptores AC2 en su nariz y por lo tanto probablemente menos facilidad para que el virus entre. La inmunidad innata de los niños es fundamental, es la primera barrera contra el virus y los niños tienen una inmunidad innata fuerte y estimulada. La inmunidad adaptativa también juega un gran papel y los niños tienen una mayor proporción de linfocitos T y B y tienen una menor capacidad de producir una tormenta de citoquinas. La reactividad cruzada de las células T se ha discutido muchísimo, parece que eh, hay una reactividad cruzada con otros coronavirus humanos y eh, no podemos olvidar que los niños están constantemente expuestos a los virus de los catarros y al del catarro común del coronavirus humano. Eh, los niños tienen constantemente infecciones recurrentes, su nariz está colonizada por otros virus que compite con el SARS-CoV-2 y puede eh, complicar su entrada en el, en, en el organismo de los niños, se han descrito con infecciones con otros virus y parece también que diferencias en la microbiota nasal y fecal de los niños podían, eh, podrían hacerles más resistentes. De hecho, hay algunos estudios en adultos en el que se ha visto que se recuperan mejor cuando eh, se les eh, administran probióticos. Las vacunas es eh, igualmente una de las cosas que eh, sobreestimulan el sistema inmune de los niños. Además de las vacunas, se han descrito efectos inesperados, beneficiosos, como la reducción que la, BDG, que la BCG produce en la mortalidad en general, se están haciendo ensayos clínicos al respecto. Y por último, la melatonina, que tiene un poder antiinflamatorio potente y que incrementa las células NK y las células T, 
está eh, siempre más elevada en niños que en adultos y también podría jugar un papel. Lo que sea seguro es multifactorial, lo que hace que los niños estén más protegidos, pero desde luego no es nuevo porque ya desde las epidemias de MERS y SARS eh, se sabe que los niños tienen infecciones menos graves también por esos eh, virus. ¿Y son o no grandes diseminadores? Esto es una cuestión que todavía está sin resolver y por la que se ha eh, discutido y seguro que vamos a discutir más eh, en los próximos meses. Por un lado sabemos que los niños tienen altas cargas virales en sus eh, secreciones respiratorias, incluso a veces más que los adultos. Los adultos eh, han eh, visto como en estas gráficas que se elimina de una manera similar el virus en sintomáticos y asintomáticos y que dura la eliminación bastante tiempo, como digo, en adultos. Pero también es importante recordar que una PCR positiva no significa infectividad. Si vemos este gráfico, eh, observamos en rojo cómo el periodo de máxima contagiosidad, de máxima infectividad, eh, se prolonga muchísimo en los individuos graves y es mucho más recortado en los pacientes asintomáticos o leves. De manera que si los niños son leves o asintomáticos, probablemente tendrán menos probabilidades de eh, contagiar. Además, hay algunos estudios como este que han demostrado que los niños asintomáticos tienen menos carga viral que los sintomáticos. Por lo tanto, yo creo que podemos decir que los niños no son súper contagiadores. Voy a terminar ya haciendo un pequeño repaso de la clínica que han tenido los niños en esta pandemia. Este es el estudio épico, que es el estudio epidemiológico nacional eh, apoyado por la Asociación Española de Pediatría. Esta es eh, la ola epidémica de la primera pandemia eh, en la que hemos visto eh, las infecciones respiratorias, los fiebres sin foco, lesiones cutáneas y con un decalaje de un mes o mes y medio los síndromes inflamatorios multisistémicos. Eh, hemos visto fiebre sin foco en niños pequeños, las neumonías de todo tipo, intersticiales, lobares, con hipoxemia, tan graves como la que aparecen en la imagen, que es de un niño nuestro, de La Paz, aunque afortunadamente han evolucionado bien y en poco porcentaje han necesitado cuidados intensivos. Hemos visto muchas lesiones cutáneas en la primera ola, no estamos viendo ahora en la segunda y hay eh, gran controversia acerca de si están o no relacionadas con la infección. Algunos autores han encontrado incluso algunas partículas electrónicas eh, del virus por microscopía electrónica. Los niños que han precisado cuidados intensivos, los pequeñitos han sido cuadros respiratorios que han necesitado ventilación mecánica. En niños mayores y adolescentes han sido cuadros similares a la neumonía del adulto y, como no, el síndrome inflamatorio eh, multisistémico. Eh, merece la pena dedicar dos palabras a este síndrome puramente pediátrico. Son niños por debajo eh, de 19 años, con más de tres días de fiebre. Deben cumplir una serie de criterios clínicos, al menos dos de eh, afectación mucocutánea, hipotensión o shock, afectación miocárdica, coagulopatía o síndromas gastrointestinales. Tienen marcadores inflamatorios elevados, no puede haber otra causa que lo justifique y tiene que haber una relación con COVID-19. En nuestra serie nacional, aproximadamente un 13 o 14% de los niños hospitalizados han sido síndromes inflamatorios. Los síntomas más frecuentes han sido la fiebre, los síndromes gastrointestinales y mucocutáneos. Un 70% de ellos han necesitado ingreso en cuidados intensivos aunque afortunadamente las secuelas y la mortalidad han sido eh, muy bajas. En el resto de la cohorte, como hemos comentado, cuadros respiratorios, eh, cuadros de fiebre y también cuadros gastrointestinales, igual que todas las series, las comorbilidades y el contacto con un paciente confirmado eh, son eh, muy frecuentes. También se han visto en niños manifestaciones extrapulmonares, igual que en adultos, las gastrointestinales muy frecuentes, y lo que afortunadamente no estamos viendo son cuadros trombóticos, es muy infrecuente en el ámbito de la pediatría. Y solo para terminar, en la segunda ola, ya estamos prácticamente inmersos en la tercera, en nuestros casos nacionales vemos que los eh, eh, ingresos de niños han seguido aumentando, pero eh, quiero llamar la atención cómo han aumentado los casos leves, la pendiente es eh, inclinada y sin embargo las neumonías parece que no son tan frecuentes como en la primera eh, ola de la pandemia. Y sin embargo, sí que hemos vuelto a ver, tras esta segunda onda epidémica, 
cómo se vuelven a repetir casos de síndrome inflamatorio multisistémico. Y con esto termino y muchas gracias eh, por la atención. Muchas gracias, Cristina. A continuación, eh, quiero introducir a la última de nuestras eh, expertos. Esta noche eh, tenemos a la doctora Dr. Rosalind Eagle. Eh, la doctora Igo es eh, profesora asociada del de, Departamento de, de Modelado de, infecciones, eh, infectios, de, de, de Enfermedades Infecciosas en el London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. La doctora Ego trabaja en modelos computacionales de enfermedades infecciosas desde el punto de vista de la epidemiología y la salud pública y su investigación se centra en el papel de la heterogeneidad poblacional en las epidemias y en la planificación y evaluación de efectividad de las vacunas. Durante la pandemia del SARS-CoV-2 ha ayudado a comprender mejor los patrones de propagación del virus mediante el estudio de los movimientos de poblaciones tanto en el Reino Unido como en otros países y previamente a su trabajo con SARS-CoV-2 estudió la transmisión del virus de ébola y fue determinante en eh, desarrollar planes de vacunación y de evaluación de nuevas vacunas para esa epidemia. Sin más dilación, les dejo con la doctora Egon. And thank you to the organizers for the invitation. So, yeah, I'm a mathematical modeler, so I use transmission models to understand and predict. What my... Oh, sorry, I just need to turn off the um, the translation. Um, I'm not sure why I can hear it in Spanish. Let me try again and see if it is. So, um, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, doing modeling in real time during a pandemic. Um, how we use our models, how we account for unknowns, how we make and update assumptions, and how we change our models to adapt to the, the, changing, um, the changing situation. So to start with, what is a transmission model? Um, well, transmission models are mathematical representations of the transmission process. And we aim to make explicit links between how infection in one person affects the probability of infection in others. Okay, so transmission models are always a simplification of the real world. And um, that's because you cannot incorporate all the complexity that you need. But the key thing is that it's not always important to do so. It's, what we need to do and what's really difficult to do is to include in your model the amount of complexity you need and simplify out what you don't. So why are these models useful in epidemics? Well, one, they help you understand the transmission process and learn about how the epidemic is spreading. You can also use transmission models to test different hypotheses about how the epidemic is spreading. And it allows you um, to make projections of what might happen based on what's happened so far. And also what we call counterfactuals. So what would have happened if? So for instance, what would have happened if school closed earlier or if you started vaccinating at a different time? They also allow you to um, evaluate and compare interventions ahead of time. So for instance, um, what about if you vaccinated at a certain speed or you started on a certain date? How does that change the epidemic that you, that you might see? And this is really important, especially for COVID, because there's a lot of different interventions happening at the same time. In the UK, we have social distancing measures at the moment, very strict ones, as well as a vaccination campaign, as well as school closure. And so you can incorporate all of these different things into the model if you can um, justify that complexity. So I think an important point that I wanted to highlight is the difference between simulation models and models that are fitted to data. So Um, simulation models generally are exploring scenarios based on the best available evidence. And this means that often they're not always fitted to an epidemic you know, trajectory so far. But they want to, um, and so I'm going to give some examples of those. You can also fit transmission models to data. And this is when you explicitly, under, um, you explicitly say, that the output of your model, you want it to look like the data, you change the parameters to allow that to happen. And that allows you to learn something about the parameter of the model and hopefully about transmission. And the purpose of these two types of models, simulations and fitted models is often different. And the unknowns um, in these two types of models are often quite different. So I'm gonna give a couple of examples of both simulation and fitted models. Um, that have been used during the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. 
So when would you want to use simulations? Well, for example, when there's little data out there, but there's good understanding of some parameters and you have a clear public health question that you want answered and that perhaps you need to explore uncertainty in some unknown parameters or the parameters related to the public health responses. So I'm going to give you two examples and I think that will make it make it clearer. Here is a situation that we, we published this work very early in February and the question was what is the um, what fraction of contacts people's social contacts must be traced and isolated to contain an introduced outbreak. This is a very clear public health question and at that point you know in February we knew some things about the incubation periods so the time from when somebody is infected to when they show symptoms we knew something about how long it was taking people to uh, to get symptoms and then to show up for a test. And so we took these this information that we did have and said, OK, well, in that in that situation, what fraction of these contacts do we need to find in order to um, in order to contain an introduced outbreak? And at that point where we were doing this work, it was the epidemic was mostly in China. So this was a key question. We're going to we know we're going to start getting imports. How can we control these outbreaks? So here you can see a schematic of the model where this first person, this, this is their timeline along the top, they're infected. And then after some incubation period, which you can see varies from person to person because it's because everybody's a little bit different, you get onset of symptoms. And then during the course of this person's infection, we say that they would have infected B here, C here, and they might have infected somebody else here if they weren't isolated. And see here, you can have you can see in green a delay from onset to isolation. Now, in this case, person B has been traced by contact tracing. As soon as they get symptoms, they isolate, and therefore we avoid these two downstream infections. Person C has not been traced, and so infects person D, E, and F um, after uh, um, after their incubation period. Okay, so then the key question is shown here using our baseline scenario which is going to be 20 infected arrivals, an average of 3.8 days to hospitalization from the onset of symptoms. 15% of transmission occurs before symptoms. Remembering in February, as mentioned earlier, this was a key area of uncertainty. And 0% um, transmission from people who are not showing symptoms. Again, something that we really didn't know at that time. So here you can see in black is our baseline reproduction number of 2.5. That means that each infected person uh, infects on average two and a half other people but we also show 1.5 so a less transmissible virus and 3.5 and more and in that case the x-axis shows the percentage of contacts that you need to trace in order to um, prevent this percentage of your epidemics so we simulate epidemics with these particular characteristics of contact tracing. And then we find that in order to um, stop about 80% or at least 80% of your outbreaks, you need to trace at least 80% of your contacts. And if the reproduction number is higher, that number is higher. But as I mentioned, this there were some really key areas of uncertainty in this work. So we also did sensitivity analyses to these unknown parameters. So what if you, in each case, the baseline is shown in black. So what if you import only five cases, or maybe you import 40? Or what if the delay from onset to isolation is longer? Or there's more transmission before symptoms, or there's more subclinical infection? How does that affect the probability of controlling 80% of your outbreaks? And you can see from the fact that these lines all have slightly different shapes, that the, that the, um, that the probability of achieving control of your uh, of the epidemic of, of these outbreaks varies in a different way according to each of these parameters. So this work was quite useful. I'm just going to briefly mention another piece of simulation work that we did about traveler screening using somewhat similar, you know, pieces of information um, because we knew that not only was, were cases going to be imported, but a key question was, can we stop that by screening travelers at the airport? And at that point, this was first online at the end of um, January and on MedArchive on February 2nd. So we used a very similar infection to onset and uh, distribution and um, similar questions about asymptomatic transmission. And we said, what is the chance that using 
um, using uh, basically fever-based screening, but symptomatic screening at origin and destination airports, you can, you can prevent cases. And what I'm showing here is that we provided this as a, as a dynamic app online so that people could change those assumptions about, for instance, the travel duration, because if you have a longer flight, people are more likely to develop symptoms in that time if they're infected. You can change all of these kind of things in order to understand how many cases you might stop. So these simulation models aim to answer very specific questions and use data, use what we know, but you can see that they're not explicitly fitted to um, any information, well, any data, any epidemic curves like you might normally expect. But why might you want then to use fitted models? So you might wanna do this when you have data and importantly, when you understand how those data have been collected, what, which is what we normally call the observation process. So this is something like, you know, maybe you, you understand that perhaps 10% of your cases are reported or perhaps you know, 60% if you increase testing, something like this. And so you, you understand these, these concepts and you want to learn something about the dynamics of transmission from the data that you have. And in that case, you can use, um, you can use model fitting um, to, to uh, learn about the, the dynamics of transmission. So I'm gonna show you two examples from the London School um, COVID transmission model group um, from our work. And both of them use the same basic model framework, which is an age structure transmission model in five year age bands. And that means we take the entire population um, and they have to be one of these disease states. And there's one of these versions for every five year age band. And the people in each age band mix together according to um, contact matrices that we have for most countries. So when people over here are susceptible, so they've not been infected, then they get infected, they're exposed, and they either go on this clinical route in dark blue, or they are subclinical, um, which sometimes people call asymptomatic, but subclinical route here. And then they uh, recover and are in this removed category here. We assume the clinical uh, route is 100% infectious and the subclinical route is half as infectious as the clinical. And the first question we wanted to answer is, um, is there a difference in the susceptibility to infection bet between adults and children? Um, as mentioned, you know, we've seen fewer cases in children all the way through. And we also wanted to ask, is there a difference between the um, adults and children in what proportion go the clinical or subclinical route through this? So what fraction show clinical symptoms on infection? Because there was a lot of debate about which it is, um, especially in the beginning. So um, I'll just very briefly go over this because it's already been covered, but you know, this, these are data from Wuhan very, very early on showing um, very few numbers of child cases. And I think this one is from March or February, very, very few cases in the youngest age groups. So we, what we did is we took the age distribution of cases, and that's what you can see in the little bar plot here of every, um, for a bunch, whole range of regions. The blue ones are in China, the orange red ones are in Italy, and then we have some data from Japan, Singapore, South Korea, and Ontario. So the bar plot shows the fraction of reported cases in each age group, and then the colored line shows the model fit. So what we did is we fitted the parameters of the model to the age distribution of reported cases in several countries from the earliest phase of the epidemic. We fitted so that you can allow a difference between countries so they don't all have to be exactly the same due to perhaps different demography or something like this. And we combined these data from multiple sources. So not only did we fit to these data, but we included information from contact tracing studies, from population studies, and from hospitalization statistics into the likelihood. And the likelihood is what defines the distance between the model and the data. And we did this using what's called Bayesian evidence synthesis, and that allows multiple data sources to inform on the quality of the fit. So using this model, what we found is that there was a difference in susceptibility in clinical fraction between adults and children. What you can see here is the age group along the bottom, 
And then both the clinical fraction and the susceptibility on the y-axis, where the clinical fraction, so that's the proportion of cases that show clinical symptoms um, in the dark line, and the dashed line shows the susceptibility. The gray one is the consensus fit of all countries, and the colors represent the, the different um, local fits, although they're relatively consistent, so it's quite interesting. And so what you can see here is lower susceptibility in children and lower probability of showing clinical symptoms if they are infected um, in children, although the, the very lowest in the 10 to 19 age group rising up through the ages. So that's what we found from that study. And that was done in um, the early stages of the epidemic. And I want to bring you right up to date with our most recent fitted, uh, fitted model, um, which is um, what we've been doing here is fitting different model variants with different mechanisms to try and understand um, what's happening with the B117 variant, which is the one that has arisen in the UK. And so what you can see here is three regions of the UK. This is proportion of um, samples, so proportion of tests essentially that are the new variant. So you can see that this rises steeply from October up to now, basically rises very steeply in all regions, all these three regions. Um, and the question came up very early is why is this happening? And so um, the five main hypotheses were that there's increased transmissibility due to the uh, variant, there's increased duration of infectiousness, there's increased immune escape, increased susceptibility in children, and a shorter generation time. And so what we did is incorporated the, these proposed mechanisms, each of these, into the transmission model, fitted those models to available data, and then you can assess the quality of the fit for each of the proposed mechanisms and ask which one is most supported by the data. And you can see here from this one piece of information, this fraction of variants, you can see that immune escape doesn't do a good job, shorter generation time doesn't do a good job, and although the other ones look OK uh, on this piece of data, this isn't the only thing they're fitted to. It's fitted to a whole range of data. So actually, for instance, the increased susceptibility in children, it creates a very strange age distribution that is not what was observed. So um, we found that the increased transmissibility model is most supported by the data. And so that is what we think is happening. And I wanted to show you here a bit more about the data that this model is fitted to so that you can see that, that it, isn't just, it isn't just one thing. So these are the seven NHS regions in England. Um, and then the model is fitted to weekly deaths, hospital admissions, number of occupied beds, number of ICU beds. It's not fitted to infections, that's the output. It's fitted to the PCR prevalence, which comes from a standardized survey in the UK. And it's also fitted to seroprevalence, which includes waning in sero, seropositivity. So that's why it goes down. And so this model is fitted to a whole range of data in order to give us those, those estimates. So once you've fitted the data, then you can more confidently make projections about what might happen in the future. And that's what we did here. Um, you can ignore the one at the top, but what we're asking here is, OK, now we've got our model. The UK has gone back into um, a lockdown type intervention. And what epidemic would we expect to see if there was no vaccination, 200,000 vaccinations per week, which was approximately what was happening in December, or 2 million vaccinations uh, per week? And so you can see that um, as, the, as our planned lockdown ends, the epidemic would come back, both for the no vaccination and the 200,000 vaccination scenario. Um, but if there were 2 million vaccinations per week, then the epidemic would recede. And indeed, we are now in, the, in um, England vaccinating at, I think, just slightly over 2 million vaccinations per week. So let's, um, let's hope for that. So these are just some examples of simulation and fitted models. But um, Models can be used for a range of purposes. And when you're reading modeling papers and interpreting those, it's important to assess what the model is trying to do. 
What's the purpose? And that purpose impacts the methods chosen and the amount of complexity that is needed. You always want to put in just enough complexity and, and no more in order to answer the question. Um, as we're doing this work in, um, in real time, new information on key parameters and uncertainties needs to be incorporated. And, you know, as modelers working on this, we try to remain extremely flexible and open minded for what could change. Um, so thank you very much for uh, the opportunity. The um, London School COVID uh, team, modeling team, um, works as a, as a group and we have an online repository of our papers, apps and reports where you can see all of our work. Uh, everything is public, including all of our code. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ross, for that great insight into the mathematical side of things. And I'm going to bring everybody back now for uh, a short debate. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes or so um, of your time, I hope. So I would like to um, use this opportunity, having Christina, Bart, and, and Rosalind with us, to ask a few questions um, about the topic that sort of um, underlined this symposium, which is what have we learned? How can we prevent? And I, I think it'd be foolish to do that before we really discuss a little bit about how we're gonna just make sure we get out of this one. <laughs> so, I, you know, I wanna draw back a little bit of attention into the new variants and what that is going to mean for the next six months or so um, across the world. So, you know, perhaps I'll start with, with you, Bart, uh, Dr. Hagmans. I, I was interested in, in whether you could give us a take about what is causing the emergence of these virus, variants. We do know that the virus has a good uh, mechanism to repair errors compared to, say, the flu vaccine, the flu virus, for example. Um, but we are seeing the emergences of, of, of variants. Um, so what is your impression of, you know, is there, is there something we need to draw attention to that is causing this? Uh, chronic uh, diseases have been mentioned, but I'm interested in what you have to say. And, and then what can we learn for uh, dealing with variants that are sure going to keep coming? Yeah, so mutations pop up uh, always and, and variants as a cause of the mutations also arise uh, quite frequently. So uh, that is not the point. It, it's <clears throat> indeed the, the pressure put on the virus, especially the immune pressure, what we see now, that is changes, especially in the receptor binding domain. And the idea is basically that <clears throat> um, probably because of some uh, treatments also, uh, for example, plasma, for reasons of convalescent plasma in patients that cannot clear the virus for longer periods, so over weeks to months, actually causes the virus to change dramatically, although we don't know that at the moment. So uh, uh, it's basically the immune pressure that is not <clears throat> able to deal with, uh, with the virus properly that causes the escape of these viruses. And of course, now the question is also whether inappropriate vaccination uh, now also um, leads to a further emergence of, of variants. Uh, although most of these variants actually are caused by escape from the antibodies. And the idea is that a proper T cell response that goes with antibodies is still able to, uh, to compete, uh, to, 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 to combat these variants. So we still need to see how this works out in real life and whether these variants can be dealt with with people that are vaccinated or experience the, the infection earlier. Thank you. And, and perhaps um, over to you, Ross, to give us a, a perspective on, you know, the, the behavioral um, changes that we've all made due to this pandemic have had a, a very important role to play in, in our societies in trying to at least make our healthcare systems manage uh, the, the flood of, of patients. In your take with these new variants now uh, showing an increased transmissibility as we're seeing, uh, are there any specific recommendations that you think um, 
government society should be following, in particular in light of the characteristics of, of, of the new variants? I mean, it's a really difficult question because, you know, it, um, you know, we've all been doing a lot of social distancing. It's very, very challenging. It's very difficult for people to do. And this came in at, in the UK at a time when, you know, things, there was a bit of um, a little bit of positivity. We had the first authorization for the vaccine. And then what we learned was the that the um, social distancing that we were doing was no longer enough because the the new variant had a higher reproduction number so it um, on average it will infect more people than the wild type um it had a higher reproduction number than the, than the wild type and therefore we had to do stricter social distancing in order to bring that reproduction number back below one so it came at a very challenging time and i think that the key thing going forward is understanding as quickly as possible if these if the vaccines that we have are going to continue to work against the new variant and as bart showed some of the very earliest data that it has some positive signs so i think that needs to keep uh we need to keep an eye on that and then continue with the with the plans so over to you christina um i'm gonna switch over to spanish uh for this question um christina um Muchísimas gracias por tu, tu información sobre los, la, 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 la patogenia en niños. Me interesa que nos cuentes si lo que hemos aprendido sobre el, la enfermedad en niños y cómo el virus se transmite en niños está eh, incitando eh, conversaciones e investigación sobre tratamientos. Has mencionado algunos en tu, en tu charla brevemente y me, me interesa saber lo que los niños nos están enseñando sobre cómo podemos aprender a tratar la, la, la enfermedad en adultos también. Bueno, la verdad es que respecto a tratamientos tenemos pocas respuestas todavía. Hay ensayos clínicos en marcha, como he comentado, eh, sobre, pues, por ejemplo, la melatonina, que se, podría ser una suplementación que podría eh, mitigar las infecciones, pero yo creo que es todavía muy pronto. Respecto a las eh, vacunas o efectos inesperados de las vacunas, también hay ensayos eh, sobre si la BCG eh, puede proteger eh, de la infección, pero realmente sobre tratamientos eficaces, pues yo creo que hoy por hoy eh, tenemos eh, poco todavía la, la dexametasona, como se ha comentado, es casi el único tratamiento que realmente eh, se ha mostrado eficaz. Y respecto a los niños, yo creo que nos queda mucho por aprender todavía. Eh, no sabemos si verdaderamente son o no son un gran vector de la infección. Hay que ver cómo se comportan estas nuevas variantes, la variante inglesa, si realmente es más transmisible y si va a cambiar el papel que tienen los niños en este, en este nuevo escenario. Eh, por ahora los niños han estado bastante confinados, aunque en muchos sitios se han reabierto colegios y al menos en España no parece que haya empeorado la situación entre los niños al menos, o sea que yo creo que todavía tenemos eh, mucho que aprender y, y los niños seguro que nos van a enseñar eh, si verdaderamente tienen un papel y si vamos a tener que tomar medidas eh, diferentes con ellos respecto a lo que, a lo que estamos haciendo ahora. Muchas gracias. Eh, nos quedan unos poquitos minutos y quisiera volver a los ponentes y presentarles una oportunidad de, de concluir la sesión de hoy con unas palabras sobre lo que cada uno de vosotros pensáis puede ser la, la medida quizá más efectiva o el, la lección más eh, importante que, que haya surgido de esta pandemia. Quisiera que cada uno de vosotros nos dierais vuestra, digamos, mmm, recomendación para los gobiernos, los investigadores, las sociedades en el futuro. Si hubiera una cosa que, que ante todo quisierais que, que pusiéramos en práctica ya para prevenir la siguiente pandemia. Así que voy a daros de nuevo la palabra para que nos eh, digáis mmm, de nuevo cuál, eh, cuál será vuestra, vuestra recomendación. Uh, 
Over to you, Bart. Uh, I hope you understood the question uh, or you got the translation, but I'm, I'm trying to give you a last opportunity as we're wrapping up now to tell us in a few words um, after what we've been through already and what's yet to come, what would be your recommendation to societies, governments, research um, community as to how we can focus our efforts to prevent um, the next pandemic? Yeah, th this is clear. And, and I mean, for years, <clears throat> we have warned for, for these kind of outbreaks. And we've seen many examples of small outbreaks that could have led to, to pandemics. That's MERS, but also other viruses in China, also coronaviruses that jump from bats to, to pigs and then are potentially uh, able to jump to humans, which, bit, which lit, didn't lead to big outbreaks or pandemics. But I mean, <clears throat> we shouldn't focus all our attention on influenza viruses because for influenza viruses, we were aware and thought that that would be the next pandemic. But it's clearly now that other viruses, including coronavirus, but many other belonging to other uh, f virus families are capable of uh, uh, going over the, uh, the transmission to from animals to humans. So I think we need to be better prepared than this holds for, for development of antivirals, but especially also uh, uh, networks for surveillance <clears throat> and diagnostics that need to be improved to be early on the ball and then communication to get things going quickly. Because also here, still, and people say it, uh, it went all quite quick, but still, I think uh, there was a lag time, which is essential in the beginning to play down uh, such an outbreak. So there's still a lot to do, I think, and I think this will come after the, the outbreak, but uh, it will continue for quite some time because this is not the last outbreak we have seen. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Hagmans. Uh, Rosalind, would you like to give us your take? Sure, no, I think that's a great question. And one thing that I would, um, that I found particularly interesting is the, is the high degree of collaboration and, and kind of open science that's been going on. You know, I'm a modeler, but all across the community, uh, the scientific community, and, you know, we've seen some of these, we've seen a lot of questions, new things that come up that get answered and the information shared really rapidly. And that's something I think, I hope will continue that the, the high degree of, of cross-disciplinary collaboration, because that's really what's needed to tackle this. Um, and so I would say that that's the, the, a big lesson learned and, you know, going forward, um, the investment in preparedness and prevention, as mentioned right at the start of the symposium, you know, we, I think that's what we need some more, um, you know, this has really demonstrated the need for preparedness, for being ready to tackle pandemics, to have the, some of these questions that we are answer, answering in real time can be answered ahead of time. And so um, really trying to get that in place because there will be another as, as Bart says. Thank you. And finally, Cristina. Uh, pues nada, coincido como no puede ser de otra manera con mis compañeros. Eh, creo que son inevitables las pandemias, seguro que vamos a sufrir más. Yo creo que de esto tenemos que aprender y mejorar nuestros sistemas sanitarios, estar mejor preparados para otras pandemias, invertir en investigación. La investigación es lo que nos va a sacar de esto. Invertir en vacunas, que yo creo que son fundamentales para, para poder eh, controlar esta pandemia. Tendremos probablemente que vacunarnos cada año de este coronavirus hasta que consigamos quitarnos lo de encima. Y de cara a la población creo que eh, quizá interiorizar un poco más eh, las medidas higiénicas y llevarlas más al día a día, porque bueno, aunque no van a ser la panacea, pero está claro que también sirven para controlar en cierta medida la pandemia este año. No tenemos gripe, no tenemos virus respiratorio sin sitial, y aunque, por supuesto, la competencia entre virus seguro que es importante, las medidas higiénicas han contribuido seguro también. Muy bien, muchísimas gracias. Pues con, con esto quisiera ya dar las gracias de nuevo a la Fundación Ramón Areces por eh, dejarnos mm, hablar con la sociedad en general sobre ciencia una vez más. 
a, a mis compañeros en Springer Nature for, para, por, por ayudarnos a, a participar y sobre todo a, a los eh, presentadores esta tarde, a Cristina Calvo, Rosalind Ego y Bart Hackmans por hacer un hueco en sus muy apretados calendarios para hablarnos sobre la pandemia y cómo vamos a prevenir que futuras pandemias ocurran. Muchas gracias a todos. Gracias.